The world moves quickly, time stops for no one, and at times it seems hard to keep up. In the modern urban jungle, the world moves much faster, sometimes almost at a frantic pace. People work around the clock, moving and changing. As time has passed, the great minds and thinkers of society have helped us provide the energy that we have so anxiously consumed. Oil. We use it to power our homes, our vehicles, and our places of work. It is the driving force that runs our world. Without it, we would be living in a motionless place. Oil, the main source of pollution, is a significant factor in the climate change we are now experiencing. Global warming is continuously altering our weather, destroying animal habitats, and threatening our planet's nature and species, including ourselves. A new source is needed, and once again, science and technology are helping us find the way. A vast array of alternative energies have been developed. Solar, wind, biofuels, as well as geothermal energy, just to name a few. A hub in technological innovations, Silicon Valley has given us microchips, computers, and other inventions that have become staples in our modern lifestyle. Here at the headquarters of some of the biggest technology companies in the world, the challenge of creating alternatives to oil is being met. New businesses and organizations have sprung up all over the valley, developing numerous new forms of energy to help the consumer reduce their carbon footprint and ease their pollution output. Institutions of education have also added departments and labs to help the thinkers and innovators of tomorrow create the new, clean sources of fuel that will help drive America and the world. Hi, I'm Grace Chen. And I'm Max Martinez. And we're here to show you what we've seen and learned from talking with alternative energy leaders here in the Bay Area. From whom we've learned that producing other sources of energy isn't a far away abstract idea. In fact, these new systems are currently being developed right here, right now. Our first interview was with UC Berkeley's Energy Biosciences Institute, an organization that researches global energy solutions and seeks to reduce the impact of fossil fuels to global warming. The EBI is the world's first research institution solely dedicated to the new field of energy bioscience, with a focus on developing next generation biofuels and applying biology to the energy sector. So the EBI probably has over 300 researchers. We have people who work in our institute that have backgrounds in almost everything you can imagine. Our first strategic initiative was really focused on malignant cellulosic um, conversions. So that's taking biomass and going through the process of converting it, breaking it down, converting it to sugars, and then fermenting that or making that into some type of fuel. So ethanol is the common choice right now. Say we're going into the field and we're going to plant these crops, and I'll use miscanthus as my example. Miscanthus is a relative of sugarcane, but it doesn't make the sugar, doesn't store the sugar in the plant. That plant's a perennial grass, which means it's going to stay in the ground, and every year you're going to cut it down, it's going to regrow for up to maybe 18 years. You've got to pre-treat it to break apart the plant cell walls, which are very, very tough, actually. So once you get these molecules broken apart and headed down these different streams for processing, then you need to incorporate some either microbes or chemical catalysts, and that end product would be the fuel. So we're trying to, to figure out what microbes, what bacteria or yeast um, or other fungi we can use in that process. So then once we have this fuel at the end, we hope that we can take it and drop it into our existing infrastructure or to distribute it and to put it in our automobiles. As we move forward in these areas, we just need to be open-minded about what we're looking at. It's really just Let's try and find the solutions that get us to where we're going to be able to keep our, our climate in check. Nature has provided the alternatives we need to become a greener people. But beyond sun, wind, or biomass, there is something deeper in the core of our Earth. Extreme heat found in hot underground water reservoirs in rock. This liquid and hot steam can be extracted to power our homes. We traveled to Alta Rock Energy in Sausalito, just north of San Francisco, to learn more about this geothermal energy. We specialize in enhanced geothermal systems. 
Most of the energy is actually held in the rock. The cracks are able to let water pass by that rock and transfer the heat from the rock into the water. We produce that water through a production well bore. When we open the valve on these production wells, just like when you pop open a soda bottle, when we open that at the surface, that hot water starts flowing up the well bore. And as it does, it boils and part of it turns to steam. So at the surface, we have a series of pipelines that gather these fluids from the production wells and bring it to the central power facility. We separate the steam from the liquid. We take all of the small water droplets out of the steam and then we send it through a conventional steam turbine. And that electrical energy then is, is shipped off to onto this larger electrical grid that covers the United States. Many tens of thousands of potential megawatts of generation could be developed in the United States if we improve EGS technology. So our focus in Alterock is to create multiple fracture sets in one geothermal well so that we can get very high productivity out of each of the wells that we drill. The potential is tremendous. Just take some innovative thinking to bring it to the forefront. Next, we visited another research organization, the Electric Power Research Institute. At their Palo Alto headquarters, we talked with EPRI to learn about their work with various alternative energies, such as solar, wind, and nuclear. We also learn about how they strive to benefit the public through their research and development. EPRI was started in 1970, and it was an outgrowth of a blackout that occurred in New York City. The federal government was not very happy with the industry as a whole, when it realized the vulnerability of the grid. It basically said to the utility industry, you need to fix this problem. And the utility industry thought it should create an independent research institute whose sole mission was to address the challenges of the utility industry. There are people here who spend their entire careers on trying to make a difference in technologies that will make life better accomplishing something for the public benefit. We just unveiled a solar assisted charging station for electric vehicles and it also has a battery storage system so that when the sun isn't shining it can store the electricity and when you want to charge your vehicle you can take advantage of that stored power. People have no idea how much electricity they use so there's a tremendous amount of research going into how to effectively integrate solar and wind into the grid. We've worked very closely with automobile manufacturers and electric utilities, and we think that moving in that direction is key to not only helping the environment, but also weaning off our addiction to petroleum products. It will take all the technologies to meet these goals. We think they all have to work together to get the results that we need as a nation and as a world. After Clay Perry talked with us, he invited us to an expo at the McHenry Convention Center in San Jose. Here we were able to see the newest technologies in the world of plug-in electric vehicles and chargers.
are going to be under the same kind of pressure that a lot of other industries are to go more toward more renewable. So anything that can be done with solar, wind, nuclear is only going to be more positive. It makes the grid cleaner, which makes our car even cleaner. I mean, we have zero emissions, period, but the electricity that provides those zero emissions needs to be cleaner, too. concept of network around charging and not just the hardware but how people interact with it. It's designed to be very consumer friendly, very approachable and um, able to kind of incorporate uh, the designs and applications that consumers, utilities, retailers want to make part of this charging network. Applying these technologies to our homes and everyday lives is the next step. Santa Clara University has shown us one example of the future's alternative energy home through what they call the Refract House. The Refract House includes energy-saving appliances, monitors, and systems. Not only is the house environmentally friendly, but it is also architecturally a modern, comfortable living space. To learn more about the house, we talked to Allison Koff. The Refract House was our 800 square foot home that Team California built for the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Decathlon. The project began in November of 2002. We built the house on Santa Clara University's campus in the summer of 2009 and then deconstructed the house there, shipped it across the country to Washington, D.C. In D.C., we constructed it on the National Mall where it stayed for about two and a half weeks where it was open to the public. The idea of the house is kind of twofold. First, that refraction is a change in a wave's direction as it passes from one substance to another. So the house, as it bends around in a U-shape, kind of the light comes in and affects the home in a technological sense. But it's also more of a metaphorical meaning in that the way that we learned in the solar decathlon affects 116,000 visitors on the National Mall, the millions of people who view each team's website. So it's kind of the transmission of information versus the transmission of light. We have the obvious solar panel array, which is a big part of the house. There are four panels that fit together kind of like a puzzle in the house. And then there's tubes running through those panels that runs hot water. And that's what actually would heat our house. But what we did that was really unique was we also ran the same system in the roof, and it ran cold water, and that's how we cooled the house as well. So we had a smart monitoring system that would measure how much electricity we were producing versus how much we were spending. We had smart windows. We had a water recycling system. We were trying to make it as smart as possible. It was really great to see how different people work together, especially architects and engineers, where you have the artists who want to make the house beautiful, but the engineers who say, well, we want to make it work. As a community, as a university, it'll continue outreaching to as many people as possible, and it'll be really interesting to see how it goes. And finally, we'd like to thank the representatives from EBI, EPRI, Alta Rock Energy, and Refract House for so graciously giving their time to meet with us. The learning experience was more than we could have ever imagined. From talking with these institutions in the Bay Area, we have witnessed the revolution that is taking hold right here in our community a revolution that is changing the face of our energy resources. Solar, wind, biofuels, geothermal. We have the technology shown in so many companies and organizations in the Bay Area to lead this path to save our planet's resources. And all this is happening as we speak. The promise of clean energy isn't just an article of faith, not anymore. It's not some abstract possibility for science fiction movies or a distant future or 10 years down the road or 20 years down the road. It's happening right now. The future is here. We're poised to transform the ways we power our homes and our cars and our businesses. That's the promise of clean energy and thanks to the men and women here today and the innovators and the workers all across America, it's a promise that we've already begun to fulfill.